All right, starting in verse 1. I'm just going to go from verse 1 to verse 10, doing my best in the short time that I have to give you the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of salvation, and then the doctrine of service. Is that cool? Yes. Awesome. Let's start with the doctrine of sin. You see in God's word, the Bible says, and you has he made alive who were dead. My, my frustration with the Christian faith is that we no longer define things. Somebody will say we are dead in trespasses and sin. You read that in the text. What does that mean? First of all, let me tell you what dead means. Dead in scripture uh, is, is, is very different than what you're used to thinking of. I will never forget, I was at camp, this guy was speaking, and he said, what does dead mean? And all of these little inner city kids, you know what they yelled out, right? They yelled out, it means dead. <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> death, biblically, simply means separation. So when we talk about physical death, your spirit, your soul, sometimes that's used interchangeably in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, your soul or your spirit is separated from your body. That's physical death. When we talk about spiritual death, when the Bible says in Ephesians 2, we were dead in trespasses and sin, that, is, that means we were separated from God. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says because of our sins, they have separated us from God. That's the idea. That's all death means. Now notice that the text says we were dead in trespasses and sins. Why does the Bible mention two different things instead of just mentioning sin? Because we kind of know what sin is, and I'll define it in just a second. The word trespass, uh, as used here, many of you know that the New Testament was written in Greek. The word in Greek literally means to fall beside. And so when we talk about trespasses, when you're on somebody else's property, essentially what the text is saying is there was something that we did not completely fulfill. Why is that important? God gave us how many commandments? Ten. In James chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, anyone who seeks to keep the whole law, yet offends in one point, is guilty of the entire law. That means if you ever sin, from birth to death, in word or action, you identify yourself as a sinner. Okay? The reason that that's important is you hear Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Before we ever act out sin, you might have heard in my prayer, big S. Notice I said S. It's a letter. Uh, get your mind out to go. Big S sin and then small S sin. Big S sin is the nature with which we are born because of Adam's sin in the garden. Everybody, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible teaches that as by one man, that one man is Adam. Sin came into the world and death came with it. Death passed to us all because all have sinned. I want you to understand, every single person on the face of this earth who has ever been born, save Jesus Christ, and I'll explain it in just a second, is born in sin. Big S sin. That is our nature. So God cannot from birth accept us. We are separated from him because God cannot be in the presence of sin. So when people say, I don't have anything in common with him. Yeah, you do. You're a sinner. <laughs> And, and, and that person is the center. And so automatically, you got common ground. You break God's law, that person breaks God's law. If you're anything like me when I was a little kid and I would do something, uh, I had a friend who will remain nameless right now. He and I would get in trouble in kindergarten. They'd shut down. Everything would get shut down through the whole class. And of course, everybody was mad at him and everybody was mad at me because we were the instigators. But whenever we were not the instigators and the whole class was shut down, I was upset. Same way a lot of us interact with God. It's like, but God, if Adam ate, why am I condemned? I, I didn't do what Adam did. I want you to understand two things. One, we are sinners by nature because of what Adam did. I want you to understand you would have made uh, in very much the same way the same choice that Adam made. You're not only a sinner by nature, but ultimately you become a sinner by choice. There's a time when by volition we say, I know what is right, and we choose to do what is wrong. And so when the Bible says we are dead in trespasses and sin, Sin is the Greek word hamartia. It means to miss the mark. So you remember I said before, we did not complete the standard. This time, uh, when the Bible says trespasses and sin, the idea is there is a mark. If you consider a bullseye, right in the center of the bullseye is where you're supposed to hit, right? To miss the mark means you don't hit the bullseye. So 100% of the time, every single person on all of the face of the earth, uh, every single one of them falls into the category of a person who does not 100% of the time meet the bullseye. That's all a sinner means. I remember cutting a guy's hair when I was at Mary Washington. I began to explain the gospel to him, and he said, I don't know why you're telling me this. I'm not a sinner. Now, again, if that raises your eyebrows, you need to know that the rest of the world, particularly if you're living in a Christian bubble, the rest of the world doesn't see themselves as sinners. Why? Because they're thinking sinners mean I killed somebody, I shot somebody, I slept with somebody's mama or brother or sister, I did something heinous. That's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is, if you have not fulfilled God's perfect law in word, in deed, in thought, that identifies you as a sinner. Am I making sense? 
awesome, and that comes from Adam. The Bible then says in verse 2, In time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan and demonic influences, um, the spirit that is now working in children of disobedience. Here in verse 3, we learn what I've said before, and I just want to reiterate and, and explain some other things. Among whom we also had our manner of life in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling its desires and the desires of the mind, whereby nature we were children of wrath. Why do I say children when a lot of translations now say objects? First of all, the Greek word technon means child. And so, first of all, that's translation. It's not objects. I want to tell you the reason that it has been translated objects is because a lot of translations now are concept for concept instead of word for word, particularly if you're talking about the NIV. Why is that important? Because the concept is we are objects of wrath, but the word actually means children of wrath. That's important to me because of what the word in Greek, wrath, means. The word is the same word where we get the word orgy. It's the idea of unrestrained lust or impulse. When you look at Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, after they bite the fruit, anybody remember the first thing that they do? They cover themselves with fig leaves. Now, God told them not to eat from a tree. They went and ate from a tree. After they ate from a tree, they went and covered themselves with the leaves from a tree. Then they went and hid amongst the trees. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> a lot of things in Scripture that we don't think about. Have you ever lived in such a way that you run from God and go pursue something that you know you're not supposed to pursue? That thing then depresses you because you pursued it, and you pursue it even more, just like they did with this tree. I talked to tons of people that have done that. I've lived it for years. And there are many of you that are sitting in this room that may be the same way. The very thing that you run from and hide from the Lord, that's where you stay in the midst when you're trying to run from the Lord and trying to hide from Him. What they did is they became children of impulse. Impulse became their father. They sinned, and immediately they said, I need to cover myself. Now, Adam, Eve, you never covered yourself before. Why are you covering yourself now? They're not even thinking about it. It just becomes natural. God comes to Adam and says, where are you? Adam immediately speaks up. Look, if you're going to play hide and seek, do a good job. <laughs> where are you, Adam? Adam speaks up immediately. I heard your voice walking in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. Adam just volunteered all kind of information that he wasn't supposed to volunteer. Why? Is it because Adam is just a moron who doesn't know how to hide? No, folks, think about it. He had never been in that. I have four children, okay? My children are a trip. <laughs> this is why I say that. I can watch that, and I promise myself I'd never do this. I promise myself I wouldn't, but I do it all the time. <laughs> I can watch them do something that they're not supposed to do. They don't know I'm watching them. I can walk into their room, and Simeon's my oldest. He's almost five, and I can say, Simeon, did you hit your sister? And he immediately bites his lip, looks down at the ground, starts kicking the floor, trying to avoid the situation. Did you hit your sister? What does he look at me and say? Now he's at the point where he says, yes, I hit my sister, and he, that incurs discipline. But initially, when he had never really lied before, he was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, dude, I saw you hit your sister. <laughs> Did you hit your sister? <laughs> it's like, why are you lying to me? I saw you. It makes no sense for you to lie. But again, he's not doing it because he's, he's a well-thought-through liar. <laughs> he's doing it because, as a sinner, by birth, by nature, he's impulsive. He's saying the first thing that comes to mind. Often, you know as well as I do. Did you hit your sister? Uh-uh. Did you hit your sister? Okay, yeah. Why did you hit your sister? What's the answer? I don't know. <laughs> then why'd you hit her? What, what sense does that make? It doesn't make any sense. That's why they're children of wrath, children of impulse. They begin to pursue selfishly impulsively, independently, numb to God and numb to everybody else. If you read Genesis 1-1, all the way to Genesis 3, verse 9, Adam never uses the word I. Right after they sin, that's the only word he uses. He says, I heard your voice in the garden. I went and hid myself because I was afraid. All of a sudden, he's speaking of himself completely separate from Eve. The last thing we heard Adam say in relation to Eve was, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. All of a sudden, he's like, shoot, God, it ain't my fault. It's hers. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Impulse. So all of a sudden, Adam is throwing back in God's face. If you wouldn't have made her, I wouldn't even eat the fruit. But you made her and put her in the garden, and she looked good and stuff. And so I just, shoot, I just wasn't even thinking. I just did whatever. I, was, I just wanted to be with her. And God comes to the woman. What did you do? Well, I mean, I was, and so the serpent, and what had happened was, and then I was like, and he was like, and shoot, that's what happened. <laughs> 
compulsive. Why is that a part of the doctrine of sin? Why is that important to know? Because unless God does something on our behalf, we would never initiate. We could never initiate toward him. We would never contemplate and saying, God, would you do something for me? If God does not initiate, we do not in any way initiate God sending Jesus. We do not initiate God coming back to Adam in the garden. From Genesis 1-1 all the way to this day right now and all the way for forever, God will always be the initiator. Notice Adam and Eve sin, and Adam does not come to God and say, Yo, God, where were you? We needed you back there when the serpent was talking. No, God comes to him and says, Where are you? And when God comes to him and says, Where are you? He gives Adam the opportunity to confess. Adam does not take that opportunity. God continues to talk to Eve to give her opportunity to confess. She doesn't take that opportunity. The serpent ain't have a leg to stand on because he knew he messed up and there was nobody else to blame. <laughs> God then judges the entire world, puts us under a curse. But in Genesis chapter 3, 15, nine verses after they eat the fruit, we hear God say, I will put enmity, that is hostility, between your seed, speaking to Eve, and the serpent seed, speaking to Satan and his demonic influences and descendants, right? That seed would be the Lord Jesus Christ who would only come through woman. Now, you heard me say, I'm moving from the doctrine of sin into the doctrine of salvation. You hear in verse 4, the word of God says, but God, we call this the big old but. Anytime God starts to move, it's the change is going to happen. God made a promise in Genesis 3.15 that he would send somebody through just woman's seed. Why would God send somebody through just a woman's seed? I'm answer that question for you. Don't feel like you've got to rack your brain. The answer is man's seed passes sin. As a matter of fact, if you read the Levitical law, anytime a man's seed of copulation comes out of his body, he is rendered, and anything else that it touches, is rendered unclean until evening. A woman's natural process of menstruation, whenever she was bleeding, I know I'm going now in anatomy, just listen to me, folks. <laughs> it all has purpose. She was rendered unclean until evening. Now, again, these are natural processes. Why in the world would God say of a natural process, this is unclean? I can tell you why. Because the first time blood was shed is in Genesis chapter 3 for however God covered them. The Bible says that God made them coats of skin. When the Bible says made, it is not the word created. It's the Hebrew word that means acquired. So God killed something. We assume that it was either a bull or a ram or a goat because that's what we see used later in sacrifices. God killed something. Blood was shed on their behalf. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says almost all things are uh, covered by the blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So whenever, God is strategic, y'all. God is incredibly strategic. God sets up life to where everything that you see on a day-to-day -day basis, according to what the Bible says in Romans 1, you should recognize that you need a Savior. Including, there is one time a month where every woman should say, I need a Savior. <laughs> I'm not joking. That is biblical. You can read through the book of Leviticus, chapter 13 through 15, and you will see that. I want you to understand that. Anytime a young man has a nocturnal emission, we should wake up saying, I need a savior. Not because of what happened and how weird it is. More so, <laughs> more so because God has set it up to where there are natural processes that happen to us that should remind us uh, of what happens with the fall. Listen, do you understand that before the fall, it hadn't even rained? The Bible teaches that it hadn't even rained. And so even when you see a raindrop, that should make you say something's broken. There was no such thing as death. When you see death, that should make you say something's broken and we need a savior. See, the more and more I understand God's word, the more and more all these people who say, what about people who've never heard? Oh, they've heard according to what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 19, what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, uh, after verse 17, because we generally stop at verse 17, it says, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The next verse in verse 18, the Bible says, did they not hear? Their voice has gone out through all of the world. The voice that he's speaking of, Paul, is quoting from Genesis chapter 19, speaking of the testimony of creation. When we see creation, look, y'all, I live in southwestern Pennsylvania where it snows like nine feet every year, okay? <laughs> God has rebuked Devour this year, and it has not snowed that big <laughs> just yet. When I see that happen, the cold air hitting up against my house, and the fact that I need to start a fire to put heat in my home should remind me that something's broken and I need to save it. Goody and I, Goody's in the back. Goody and I went on a trip because uh, we take kids on wilderness trips. We went on this trip and we were crossing this beautiful like stream slash river 
And I was crossing it, and like Psalm 23 is banging in my mind, and I'm thinking he leads me beside still waters, and it's just this pristine lake, and I'm having this amazing time with the Lord. And I do like this, and there at my feet, right in the middle of the joint, is this dead deer carcass with a big old stick sticking out of it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, man, even out here where it seems like this is completely untouched by man, I'm reminded of the curse. I'm reminded of my need for a savior when I see things like this. When you see roadkill, you should say, I need a savior. When, isn't it amazing that we call it the fall? All of the leaves are gone except for the evergreen tree, which should make you say, I need a savior. In the midst of everything that looks like death, all of the leaves have fallen off. Still, there's an evergreen tree that stands to say, I need a savior. That first blood of spring that you see should make you go, I need new life too. That's how God set up this world. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he set on us, even when we were dead in sin, quickened us. Listen, we did not make movement to him. The doctrine of salvation starts with the sovereignty of God. We did not make movement to him. He initiated movement to us. The Bible does not say that Adam said, God, can you hook me up with some clothes? I need my leaves off. These Jordan fig leaves that you gave me, they, they're not good enough. I'm going to need something like Gucci. I need, I need something better. Not what he said. Ultimately, God comes to them and says, take those old rags off. My translation, it don't really happen like this. This is just imagination, a little bit of conjecture. Just listen. God says, take these fig leaves off. They can't keep you warm. They can't take care of you. What I'm going to need to do is kill something on your behalf, and I will give you new clothes. I want you to understand that that comes by grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Some people have said it's God's riches or God's righteousness at Christ's expense. It all depends on what denomination you grew up in. I'm somewhat kidding. Very seriously, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says that Jesus was made to be sin, though he knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus came to this earth in flesh. He's 100% God, 100% man, came to this earth in flesh, lived a perfect life for 33 years, never sinned, not one time. He had siblings. Never sinned one time. Okay? He didn't throw Doritos at the back of somebody's head. He didn't cut a little girl's hair in the midst of the fifth grade with some scissors just because he wanted to see what would happen if he cut them. Life and stories from the Black and Smiley's book. Um, he didn't do that. He never sinned one time, which made him the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He did not die as a moral example. And he indeed died. Okay? He didn't get knocked out. He wasn't unconscious. Some of you have seen the movie Thor. Okay? When Thor gets hit by the destroyer, Thor dies at that point. Okay? Odin brings him back to life. At least that's what I'm hoping. Because if he just get knocked out, how is that a sacrifice? He just knocked out. He'll wake up in like 20 minutes. <laughs> Did you give him some ibuprofen for his headache? He'll be fine. Why am I spending time on that? Because there are people who think that Jesus didn't die. No, Jesus died. Not only did he die, he stayed there for three days in order to prove his death. And then he rose. Can I tell you that the climax of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I want to read something to you. Most of us never make this connection. Listen to verse 5. Even when we're dead in sins, he has made us alive together with Christ. Wait a second. I thought Jesus was dead. No, 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 no. He was, but he's not dead anymore. Notice, he made us alive together with Christ. That means Christ was made alive. You might hear Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You talk about what you love. You talk about what has happened to you. If you're the type of person who says, I'm a Christian, but it's private. I don't tell anybody. I question whether or not you're a Christian. The Bible then says, by grace, you have been saved. And he has raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places. Notice, this time we get another uh, preposition. We call this prepositional faith. faith uh, prepositional faith. First, we hear uh, that, that we are with Christ. Then he says, in Christ. Now, now we can kind of get what with means. But sometimes, you know, you know how you go with somebody to a concert, you go with somebody to somebody else's house, but you don't see that person for an hour, but you're with them? You know what I'm talking about? You ever had that happen? That's, so we kind of get a sense for what with means, but is Christ with us like that? Well, we get even more of a definition when we hear the word in. 
You know what I'm saying? In Tyler Commons, in this building, when people look here, they see Tyler Commons well before they see me. And for the believer, that is what life looks like. The world sees Christ well before they see us. Whether we know it or not, whether we, whether we think about it. When the Bible says we are in Christ, in Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says that when Christ, who is our life, we are hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, will appear, we will appear with him in glory. I want you to understand that we are hidden in Christ. That means when God looks at us, not just when everybody else looks at us, when God looks at us, guess who he sees first? He sees Jesus first. Guess what that means? That means whatever God does for Jesus, with Jesus, he does for us, with us. That means everything that God gives Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is the heir of all things. That means anything that we receive. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that we are joint heirs of God with Christ. In John chapter 17, verse 3, the Bible says this is eternal life, that you might know God, the only true God in Jesus, whom he sent. Everything that God gives Jesus, God gives to us. us. And if you got stuff like this, you're going, awesome, I'm going to get my mansion, I'm going to get my golden street, and I'm going to put my name on a piece of gold and I'm going to block, and I'm going to put my name on my car in heaven. What you need a car for? You in heaven. <laughs> you don't understand heaven. Heaven is that we get opportunity to meet the love that has loved us ever since time began. That is the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation is not about what we get. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not about what we give as much as it is about what we get. And I think there are tons of times we think, man, it's about what I give. It's about me giving my life. You've heard statements like this. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Well, well before you accepted Jesus as your Savior, Jesus gave himself as your Savior. And I think that's more important than I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Or I gave my life to Christ. Well, well before you gave your life to Christ, he gave his life to you. So all that you did because of God's initial movement to you is ratify the reality that Christ has a reward for his suffering. So Christ has a reward, and then you are engrafted into that at the moment that you believe. Who does that put the onus and emphasis on when we hear, by grace are you saved? Through faith. Puts the emphasis on God. God it, grace is the means by which God can offer salvation to us. Faith is the means by which we then ratify that. It's kind of like this. If somebody wrote you a blank check, or if somebody wrote you a check for $3 billion, you still go and cash it. That still has absolutely nothing to do with you. Am I making sense? You apply that to your account, but it still has absolutely nothing to do with you. They initiate it. They make sure that the bank existed, and then all you have opportunity to do is enjoy what has been given to you. And we call that the doctrine of service. Notice what the Bible says in the rest of this text, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ. By grace you say through faith and not, not of yourselves. Listen, it's the gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. For we are his workmanship. The Greek word for workmanship there is the word poema. It's where we get the word poem from. The idea is God is saying we are his masterpiece. But notice the next thing that the text says. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, you want to talk about stuff that messes with your theology or messes with your idea of life? You know, we got these statements like, create your own destiny. According to what this says, there's already one for you. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do that. Now, if you expected me in the little bit of time I got to explain predestination, God's election, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you it's a biblical concept that God initiates toward us. God chooses us according to what Jesus says in John chapter 6. And it doesn't matter to me where you fall on the end of the spectrum. All you need to know is all of us agree it's a predestination election a biblical concept. Somehow God sovereignly elects, chooses us. Somehow we still have responsibility to not just grasp hold of that faith, but then live in what God has given People who say, but I don't understand that. I don't understand all the physics. I ain't gonna jump off this building. <laughs> My job is not to understand it. Listen to me very carefully, folks, because the world will look at you and say, I have no respect for a God who just chooses nonchalantly who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Well, first of all, if he's love, he's not choosing nonchalantly, and it's not based upon what we do or don't do. It is an unbiased choice. His choice is, I will save anybody who believes by faith. You want to be accepted and elected? Believe by faith. You're chosen. <laughs> it's just that simple. It's like I tell people all the time at camp. They're like, I'm praying about where I'm supposed to go. Look, once you sign a contract, camp becomes God's will. 
<laughs> Point blank. Why? Because the contract says, I will fulfill my commitment to show up on your doorstep unless my mama dies. <laughs> so once you sign that contract, you have now obligated yourself to showing up this year on July 12th at our door. Why am I saying that? Because I think there are tons and tons of times where we think we got to go do something for God as if he ain't already making it happen. I mean, if God needed you and needed me, he wouldn't be God, would he? The reality is he doesn't need any of us. But as the text says in verse 4, he wants us. How does he get us? By grace through faith. When he gets us, what does he do with us? He allows us to enjoy the reason for which he bought us in service that he has already ordained that we would so there are people in your dorm right now that God wants you to talk to that he knew that before time began. He knew you would hear this message right now. He knew you'd be here tonight. He knew what you'd do with your children years from now. God already knows that. What should that make us say? That should make us say um, the value and dignity. I mean, we believe the value and dignity of all people created in God's image to live in love and holiness but alienated from God and each other because of our sin and guilt and justly subject to God's wrath. You know the next part talks about Jesus. What should that make us say? That should make us say thank God for Jesus. Thank you for coming into Jesus Christ. Thank, thank you for him coming into the world to save me from my sin, my self-focused, independent impulse of numbness to God and God's agenda because I could not have won myself on my own. Can I tell you, on this side of salvation, on this side of service, the rules don't change. If you got salvation by grace through faith, you keep salvation by grace through faith. Remember, you're with God in Christ. You think at some point God is going to go, yeah, Jesus, you keep messing up up here, so I'm just going to turn you loose. Not going to happen with God and Jesus, right? So how is that going to happen with you? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 that there will be many who come to the Lord in that day, that day of judgment, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out devils? And you know what Jesus' response is, right? Depart from me, you work of iniquity. Listen, I never knew you. For an omniscient God to say, I never knew you, is huge. Why? Because he's not saying I knew you at one point when you was doing good, but then you started tripping. And I was like, deuces, peace, I don't, I'm done with you. No, the reality is, Either you have come to God by grace through faith, you have asked him to take away your sin, change your nature, you have received God's gracious gift of salvation, or you are still doing something trying to get to him, in which case he does not accept you. If you want God to accept you, the only way God is going to accept you is on God's condition. What is God's condition? By grace through faith. If you think it, but God, I go to I be, but God, I go to church, but God, I, but God, I, but God, I, God says, it doesn't matter what you did, do, or it doesn't matter what you did. It matters what I do, and it matters what I did. And I sent my son Jesus, and he already died. And so if you want to put your faith in his finished work and in his resurrection, I'll accept you all day long, twice on Sunday. <laughs> but if you don't want to put your faith in that finished work, if you want to say, I got faith in that finished work, but just in case I'm going to do all this other stuff, I don't accept that because it's not faith in his finished work. Am I making sense? Enjoying what God has called us to. I think a lot of times we think God just saved us from sin and from hell. But if he saves us from something, he got to save us to something, right? How many of you enjoy the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast? I think my favorite scene, this is going to sound a little crazy at the beginning, but, but you got to listen to me. My favorite scene is when the beast gets all upset, Belle runs from the castle, and the wolves begin to attack her. <laughs> just, just listen to me, please. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm sound like a really horrible dude. <laughs> the beast comes out and then essentially sacrifices himself, gets all cut up, saving her from all of the wolves. Listen, saving her from all of the wolves. Now listen, if he was just laying down, all of the wolves pieced out, and she jumped up on her horse, Felipe, and she went to the house. <laughs> what did he save her to? Absolutely nothing. But the mere fact that he saved her from the wolves turned her heart to him in such a way that he saved her to himself as well. So he didn't just save her from wolves. He saved her to relationship. Because y'all know what happens next. They go back to the castle. She begins to bind up his wounds. He yells at her because of what she's doing to bind up his wounds. She thanks him. He says for the first time, you're welcome. And we begin to see the heart of this beast melt. Why is that important? 
because for the Lord, we are indeed the beast. He never runs. He knows exactly who we are. He knows exactly what we, how we run from him. He knows when we hide. He knows where we hide. And he says, look, I got arms wide open, and I died so that I could live again, so that in your death, you can live again. See, he took your place in death that you might take his place in life.